Our scripture reading for this evening's sermon is taken from Psalm 90. Psalm 90, a psalm that is uh, familiar for us at different uh, special times of the year. A psalm that we will turn to tonight to help us uh, consider uh, and reflect upon the identity of our God, his nature, particularly as it is revealed to us in the attributes, the attribute of eternity. Let's ask our God for his blessing. Our Father in heaven, we know that you have spoken your word at many times and places of old, and that you have now come to speak to us in these last days through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of Jesus and We ask now that we would be able to hear the voice, the word of Jesus, and that the Holy Spirit would illumine our hearts and our minds to be transformed, not according to the things of this world, but according to Christ and the eternal things of heaven. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 90, this is God's word. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are seventy, or even by reason of strength eighty, Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord. How long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. That your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So far the reading of God's word. Please be seated. Well, congregation, last, one, last time we were together for evening worship anyways, we heard from Deuteronomy 26, or rather Deuteronomy 6, not 26, but Deuteronomy 6, when, when God commanded the families of Israel to talk about his word, to teach his word. And, and he didn't mean by that just to simply read the word if they were able or to memorize the word, as much as to talk about what his word means and how his word applies to life. And again, we heard from Jesus in Matthew 28, when he commands the church to make disciples by baptizing and teaching his word, he means uh, that they would not simply remember the words that he said, but what his teaching meant and how the the truths or doctrines of Christ were meaningful for them as his people. And so the church grew, didn't it? Uh, Not only remembering the word of God or reading the word of God as they were able, and not simply teaching it, but but teaching and confessing what it reveals, the truths and doctrines that God intends for us to know, understand, and believe. This becomes even more clear as we move further through the Gospels and through Acts into the, 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 
the pastoral epistles. For example, as Paul writes to the church of Rome, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Again, as Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, Ephesus chapter 4, uh, he appeals to them that we would no longer be like children tossed to and fro by the waves and the winds of life. How can we not but think about uh, the last week where these mighty trees seem like they're able to withstand anything until there is a little bit of rain, freezing, and some wind, and they come crashing down. So also the church, Christians, can appear strong. But Paul knows better, not to see by what appears to be true. And he warns them about being cast around and broken up by every wind of doctrine, by the crafty words and ideas and philosophies of men and peeling instead that they would be conformed to the word and the doctrine of Christ. And in his pastoral letters to Timothy and Titus, this becomes even more prominent. So, for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul warns Timothy about those who would teach any other doctrine than what, than what he had specifically been given by the apostles. So if Paul's warning Timothy about false doctrines, he's, he's pointing him to remember and to cultivate the truth that he was given. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he writes, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. You see the parallel. Timothy has been called by Christ to, to teach the words of the faith, namely the doctrines that he had been given, and be prepared to rebuke those who would contradict it. Similarly, for elders in and, uh, Titus chapter 1, Paul writes, an elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as he has been taught, so that the elder may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine as well and likewise to rebuke those who contradict it. In Titus Timothy chapter, rather in Titus chapter 2, Paul goes on to say to Timothy specifically that his preaching, his teaching, is to be a preaching and teaching of, quote, sound doctrine. And I could go on, but maybe a, a, a citation from Hebrews 6 would suffice as, as a further, further example where the, uh, the preacher writes, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity. That's interesting. He says, don't, don't stay with the, the elementary or the earliest and easiest doctrines of Christ. Maybe like a recitation of John 3.16 is, is profound and wonderful as it is. The apostles saying, don't be content with, with just the words themselves, but go deeper. Or when Jesus goes around in his ministry preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God, saying to the people, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. Not merely to, to rest in what the words themselves say, but what the words mean. To go deeper into the doctrines that God has given to us, we grow from faith to faith in a greater maturity of Christian life, a greater sharing of Christ and all of his riches. And so we read the word and, and we confess what the Word has to say, and we, we're, we're, we're doing so in 2024 with help from the Belgic Confession. I invite you to turn with me to the Belgic Confession, page 153 in our book of Forms and Prayers, and um, want to reflect upon how it begins how those who have, have gone before us like the apostles, like, like 
Timothy and Titus, um, how their teachings have been read and understood and confessed by the church. In our own confession, we have Article 1, speaking of God. It goes like this. We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God. And this God, we know, has a number of attributes. He is eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just and good, and the overflowing source of all good. There there are benefits to this knowledge of God. And that's where I want to bring us for our first point this morning, is to consider not only to read the Word and confess the truths and doctrines that are there, but to be clear that in doing so, there are there are benefits, there are profound benefits to knowing God and his attributes. In a similar way to all the, some of us can remember the season in life where we were dating or courting. Some of us are anticipating the season of life to be dating or courting. Some some of us might be right there in the middle of it. Think about the profound benefits of knowing that significant other. Not only that he or she exists, but coming to better understand their attributes, their qualities, their characters, what they like, what they don't like, what sets them apart from others, why it is that you are so strangely drawn to this one, to this glorious creature, and not another. It's similar in our relationship with God. We find ourselves inclined to know more of him. That's why we're here, so that we could be with our God, so that we could hear from our God, not only that he exists, but what he exists as, what he is like. And that brings us to his attributes. Not only as they are true of God, but as especially as they are true for us. Think about that significant other. It's one thing to marvel over her beauty. It's one thing to be be struck by his strength. But, But when that beauty and strength becomes yours, now there is a treasure to behold. That's what we consider as we come to think of God through the study of his word, as we come to confess the truths and attributes of him. We come to hear how they are not only true of him, but how they are true for us. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, God reveals to us that he is the self-existing, eternal, and almighty creator. What that means is that God exists in and of himself. He depends on no one or nothing else. And his power, his power is almighty. It's without end. And not only that, but we find in Genesis 1 that he is also the benevolent giver of every perfect gift. An eternal being with an eternal power and a spirit inclined to abound in good for all that he has made. Exodus chapter 3, another example, God comes there and tells us his name. His name, I am that I am. You see, our God is not merely an impersonal power like the sun, but he is the God who eternally exists in relationship and for relationships. He has a name, after all, and he wants us to call upon him by name. In the Old Testament, it was, I am, Yahweh. In the New, it is through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But we find then in the name of God is once again an affirmation to his self-existing eternal identity and his inclination, his propensity to be an overflowing fountain of goodness and grace into the lives of his creatures. Deuteronomy chapter 6 emphasizes this when it reveals God as his greatest desire is what? To share love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Not that he needs our love, mind you, but that he is the one eternal God abounding in love and, and his actions of creations are for that love to be reflected and shared and refracted. God delights in the sharing of his love. These truths and doctrines then give us a portrait of God, don't they? A, a kind of picture of, of who he is, what he is like, the attributes that are true of him and for us, for you and for me. A living picture that helps us to know him, to see him, and to experience him in relationship. Consider the Psalms, that, that theology of Scripture Psalm 2, for example, confesses the, doctrines, uh, uh, the doctrine of God's power and applies it as a warning to all who would stand against him and blessing for all who would seek him. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. His wrath is quickly kindled. And yet, blessed, happy, joyful are all who take refuge in him. You see the identity and attributes of God, not only of him, but for all who seek him. Psalm 23, likewise, confesses the personal nature of God, the grace of his covenant, and uh, the application of this truth is the assurance of his presence and love for his people. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The Lord God Almighty, he personally comes and acts to restore my soul. And Psalm 136 brings a kind of crescendo to this confession, speaking about the steadfast love of the Lord, the unchanging, the unchanging faithfulness of the Lord for his people. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. How does it go? His steadfast love endures forever and ever and ever without end. It brings us to consider the attribute of God's eternality. The eternality of God as we find it in Psalm 90. Notice with, uh, notice with me here how Psalm 90 confesses and applies the um, eternality of God. Or if you're taking notes, if etern eternality is not only hard to say, but hard to write, we're simply speaking about that our God is eternal. Our God is eternal. Listen, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Do you hear the voice of God's people confessing the truths of our God and his word? In the first place, he is identified here as the dwelling of all generations the dwelling place of all generations from Adam and all who come from him, especially Abraham, the covenant community, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 
Generation after generation has found their life in God. Now, to be clear, generation after generation doesn't find their life in gods who come and go. But from Adam to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, from generation to generation, we confess that life is found in God, the one true eternal God and God alone. Notice how this confession of Psalm 90, it contrasts God with men, with men and women and children. You see, we are all finite. We are finite. We are limited by time. The psalm says that we are like dust that is here and then swept away. We are like grass that flourishes for a time, and then we fade and wither and die. But not God. Notice the contrast that we are finite and he is eternal. He is not limited by time. Our God has no beginning and no end. As the creator of all things, he is before all things, even before time and space something that makes the physicist head spin and their heart warm. In the Bible, time is a matter of days and seasons and years. God creates time and he enters time, but he's not bound by time. The past, think of this, the past, present, and future are all alike one eternal now for God. We might think about time as a flowing stream. For us, we stand, at the, we stand on the shore. And, and what do we see but, but a glimpse of the water that is there before us, before it rushes past, and that which was before comes. Do you see the picture? The best we can do is to see what has come before us, not what is upstream, not what is downstream, but all we can see. See, we are limited to that glimpse as finite creatures. But, but God, you see, he, he stands back. And, and from his vantage point, as he presides over the heavens, he sees what is to come and what is and what was in an instant, in a moment, the past, present, and future and eternal now for him. God stands above it all, presiding over the source, the beginning of the river, while at the same time seeing its end, enjoying the present. Another teacher writes this, For God there is no distinction between past, present, and future, but all are equally and always before him, because God is eternal. His being, his nature, he is eternal. His attributes are eternal, without beginning and end. Think about that. The knowledge of God is eternal. The presence of God is eternal. The power of God is eternal. The righteousness and wrath of God is eternal. His goodness and grace, eternal. What does the psalm say? His steadfast love, eternal. His mercy never comes to an end. What this means, congregation, is that since God is eternal, his judgment and his wrath against sin are likewise eternal. Jesus describes it as an unquenchable fire of hell. And likewise, since God is eternal, the grace and love of the gospel is eternal. The grace and love of the gospel is eternal. That's what Jesus is saying in John chapter 8 when he says of Abraham, he rejoiced to see my day. 
He saw it and was glad, or actually better. He says, before Abraham was, what? I am. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. He is eternal. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, he's not limited by time. Jesus is eternal. And that's why Jesus prays in John 17, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Why? Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all you have given him. Eternal life to all that you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may truly know you the only God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus goes on here to say, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, now glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had, the glory that I had with you before the world even existed. His own praying of the word, that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God because the Word was God. All things was created through Him. As Colossians says, for Him. Jesus is eternal. And He has come to bring about an eternal gospel. The eternal gospel of eternal life for sinners in heaven. And this same truth, that we find this same truth, this, this doctrine of eternal gospel, not only confessed, mind you, but celebrated, celebrated in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, where we have those sweet words, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. You see, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons, heirs of the eternal kingdom of heaven, and all to the praise of his glorious grace. The self-existing, eternal, almighty God who delights in abounding in good and grace for those that he's made, even sinners like you and like me. Time won't allow us to unpack the, the riches of this doctrine quite like um, one pastor and teacher named Petrus van Maastricht. Uh, this, this individual, not so well known to us, but he was the theologian for the esteemed Jonathan Edwards. What Calvin was for many of us, van Maastricht was for Calvin. There's a lot to celebrate about the attributes of God. Likewise, more recently, uh, Terry Johnson, a trustee of Westminster Seminary, California, writes, such a, a blessed volume, developing the identity and attributes of God. And, and both of them are inclined to conclude in similar ways, not only celebrating what is true of God, but helping us to see how it is for you and me, members of his church. Van Maastricht, for example, writes that this doctrine of God's Eternality inspires praise, doesn't it? <laughs> you can't read Psalm 90 and, and its confession of God's eternal nature and attributes without being inspired to, to celebrate him. Likewise, this doctrine of God's eternality reveals the contrasting vanity of all other things. The creator-creature distinction, we often say, where only the creator is eternal. The creature is not. 
Our God is infinite. We are finite. Even all of the things we love, the greatest of kings and princes and presidents, they come and go. The might of military may win a battle, but only for a time. Our jobs, our money, how far do they really go? Our sports heroes, the statistics we love to look at, maybe of others, maybe our own, our grades. The things we love in this world are vanity, the scriptures say, because they all are governed by the passing of time. And the greatest of treasures here, even the families we love and the breath within our lungs will come to an end. And therefore, it is good to dwell upon this doctrine of eternity, of how it is true of God, but not for us, unless we find our life in him. This doctrine offers comfort to us in the face of all evil, recognizing that not only the good things in life are vain, namely that they are limited by time, they're here for a time and times and half a time, but they come to an end. Likewise, all that is evil, O Christian, be comforted to know that the trials you face will soon pass. In time, our God will make it all right again. This doctrine of God's eternality draws us back from sin because we recognize that sin is not merely something that stings, but sin is a disease. Sin is that which demands his wrath, and his wrath is eternal. The one who sins against the Creator without the Redeemer is under an eternal wrath and judgment. And to meditate upon the things of God in eternity are to bring us face to face with what is before us should we die outside of Christ. And likewise, this reflection and meditation upon the things of our God and his eternal nature bring us to recognize the sweet blessedness of being in Christ, the eternal blessedness of being in union with Jesus Christ, together with him adopted into the eternal family of heaven, with Jesus being heirs of the riches of his kingdom. O congregation, let us not deal lightly with our God. And the picture we have before us tonight, but let us ponder it, meditate upon it, confessing it, believing from the heart, and confessing with the mouth one true eternal God who in Christ is for you and for me. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the great gift of your word for the riches that are revealed there of you and for us. We pray, O Lord, that you would help us to deal more seriously with sin, to live with a greater fear of that wrath that is kindled against all who fall under your judgment, and that thereby we would find ourselves duly warned and and brought closer to Jesus and that we would find our souls inspired to celebrate you for the gospel that Jesus has accomplished, and that we would find ourselves warmed and comforted by that abounding expression of your steadfast love for us through the cross and empty grave. We ask this only for Jesus' sake. Amen.